So in this video, I'm gonna be doing a DIY snare drum from start to finish using this cherry snare shell. Let's check it out. So the reason for doing this video is I'm a drum addict, let's be real. Uh, but the other reasons are that currently I have three snares that I rotate between. One's brass shell, aluminium, and then my thick red gum DIY snare shell. And I don't actually have any thin ply wooden snares, so I just wanted something different to try out. So I ordered this six ply 7.5 millimeter cherry snare shell from Drum Factory Direct. And it's a really nice looking shell. Um, the bearing edges are really clean. Uh, there are no gaps in the ply around the shell. And they've even tried to bookend the seam on the outside. So, you know, the ply pattern matches up um, at the seam, which is really nice. It's a really good looking shell. So what I'm gonna be doing to it is staining it black so that it matches my Tama Star Classic in the background using some wood stain called Black Japan by Feast Watson. Then I'm going to be putting a gloss clear coat uh, water-based on it using this Cabothane Clear. So once the finish is done, I'm gonna be putting some chrome hardware on this, tube lugs, trick throw off, um, triple flanged hoops. And then for the batter side, my favorite batter side head is an Emperor Vintage and then a standard Ambassador uh, snare side for the bottom head. And then some Evans blasters um, for the snares. Super excited about this one. Let's get into it. So using some gloves, a cotton rag and the stain, I started off by staining the drum giving the bottle a good shake to make sure that it's all mixed up and then dabbing a little piece on the cloth and starting with a test on the inside to make sure I was happy with the color before applying it to the outside and just using soft swell marks and topping up the rag as needed. Um, you can do a couple of passes with stain to make sure it's really soaked in and then you finish by giving it a wipe with a dry cloth to wipe any excess off and allowing it to dry before putting the first coat on. And so this is what the drum looks like with the first coat of stain applied. So onto putting our first layer of clear coat. I opened up the clear coat, um, gave it a really good stir. It took a few minutes because it was a bit clogged up down the bottom. And then trying to use nice, slow, long brush strokes to apply the water-based poly. Um, it went on pretty easily. And there's a little look at what the first coat looks like. And as you can see, there's a few brush strokes, which I wasn't too happy about, but we're gonna talk about that later. So after each coat, it's a good idea to give the poly a light sand just to knock back any bumps and also to help even out some of those brush strokes. I did work out, however, that it is best to do a wet sand in between coats uh, because the dry sand had a tendency to leave bigger scratches and a wet sand's a little bit more delicate. So definitely do wet sand in between coats. Um, and then here's me applying a final coat with a sponge brush to try and get a streak free finish. However, I wasn't quite happy with the finish that I got with the water-based poly. And as you'll see in the next cut, I decided to rip it all back with a sander. Um, that's the great thing about timber. You can just sand it back and start again. And so a couple of the reasons I wasn't happy with the water-based finish was it was leaving a lot of streaks and it just didn't have a professional looking finish. It was not glossy. It had like a plasticky tinge to it. And so that's why I decided to strip it back and go with an oil-based poly. So I made sure I sanded all the water-based poly off and then I restained the shell using the same process as the first time. Only difference is this time I'm in my flip-flops instead of my working boots. Take two. This time we're going for an oil base and we're gonna apply it with a roller. The logic of using the roller was that it would leave me with a smoother finish. I've used a roller before for oil-based paints on tiles and I had really good results. And so I started using the roller, but I ended up not being too satisfied with the results and I had a change of tack. Another issue that I ran into that I'll call out here was by leaving the drum to dry on the mat, I kept getting drip marks because the poly just wanted to drip straight off the drum and onto the mat. And so for the last few coats of poly, I implemented a change to the way I painted and dried the drum, which you'll see later. There are actually quite a few air bubbles. So what I might do is just grab my brush and go over it, just back brush it once to get out those air bubbles. So I pulled out the brush again, gave it a soak in mineral spirits, and then loaded it up with poly and back brush the uh, finish from the roller, which as I explained at the time was leaving way too many bubble marks in the finish. So I put about five coats of oil-based poly on now, and I'm happy with the thickness, but because I've been doing this in a very dusty shed and with a paintbrush, there are some imperfections on the surface. So 
you can see some little dust marks right there. Um, there are some streaks through here. Uh, and basically we want to remove those to make sure that the finish is perfect. Here's a, here's a big dust mark. Hopefully you can see that on the camera right there. What we are going to do is start with some car polish um, with a buff and a microfiber cloth on a random orbital sander to see if it does the trick. And if there isn't enough abrasion capacity in the buff, then we're going to use some wet and dry sandpaper. I've got up to 2000 grit, but all the way down to 400 grit and stick on. So the basic the idea here was to cut and polish the polyurethane, which isn't a common technique among woodworkers, but it works for clear coat on cars. So I thought to give it a shot. It hasn't gotten any of the dust marks out. So next I'm going to try 2000 grit to see if that gets it out. So the basic idea here is I'm starting at the highest possible grit and working backward to work out the minimum grit I need to get the dust marks out. And turns out that's 600 grit. Once it's a satin finish, you could almost stop there, but we're going to gloss. So next up, 2000. So I went all the way down to 600 grit, then went up to 1200, followed by 2000. I reckon it's time for some polish. Let's give it a shot. And just so you don't all make my mistake, grit progression is super important. So make sure you're stepping up the grit by a factor of 1.5 to two times. If you go more than that, then you're not gonna get the scratches out from the first grit that you used. That compared to that, that looks real nice. Still a few dull streaks through there, so I just need to put a bit more elbow grease in. That was exhausting. All right, I've gone once around with the polish. Uh, so let's give it a wipe down with the microfiber and see if any areas need a second pass. That is pretty nice. All right, there's a section through here that I don't think I've put enough elbow grease into. Hopefully you can see that on the camera. The reason I ended up polishing by hand was because the sander wasn't doing the trick. Um, maybe next time I'd have better luck with a foam disc rather than a microfiber, but doing it by hand is really hard work. Finally done. And how is that glossy, dust-free, incredibly smooth finish? It feels like glass. That is awesome. All right, now it's hardware time. So I took the shell inside and started taping it up for where I needed to drill holes to attach the lugs, the air vent, and the strainer. And I just used some standard masking tape to make sure it didn't damage the shell. Using tape is super important. One, it allows you to actually draw the marks where you need to drill. Two, it stops the drill bit from slipping when you drill. And three, it also helps prevent tear out. So next I stuck a piece of paper down on the desk with tape on all four corners and then used the hoop as the source of truth for the spacing of the lugs. So I marked little crosses underneath each of the holes while taking extra care not to move the hoop in between markings. Then I drew lines between all the lug markings that I made and this helps do two things. All the lines should cross exactly in the middle which proves that they're in the right position and two the markings go all the way up to the side of the shell which helps me mark the points on the drum. So here I'm just marking all the lug points at the base of the drum using the masking tape and the lines that I drew on the paper before and then using a right angle rule to draw a vertical line from the lug point at the bottom all the way up to the top of the shell. And this is going to give us our line that we're going to use to attach our lug to. Next up I measured out the spacing of the lugs which was 88 millimeters. Used my calculator to work out how far from the top or the bottom that I needed to attach the first and the second fixing. Then I went around the shell, marked all the points and did a double check to make sure I'd spaced them correctly. Next up was the strainer butt. I measured that out, put a piece of tape across the drum and marked the points for that one. And last but not least was the strainer itself. I believe I checked my other snare drums for how high to place the strainer in the butt plate and all of them were around 50 millimeters above the bottom edge of the drum. Now this step is super important. Basically what I'm doing is making a little marking using a nail tap to mark exactly where we want the drill bit to go. It gives it a grip point to make sure it doesn't slip off the marking. So first up, I drilled all the holes with a four millimeter bit, which was the size of the screw fixing for the lugs. The strainer and the butt plate used a five millimeter bit. So I went back through them with the extra millimeter. And then I checked what size drill bit that I need to drill the flange for the lugs. 
and I think that was six mil from memory. So I went back and put a piece of tape on the end of the bit because I wanted to make sure I only went through the drum by about four or five mil. And then I checked to make sure that the lug fit. The air vent was a couple of millimeters bigger than my largest drill bit. So I just shimmied the drill around a little bit to make the hole bigger. Now for me, this is one of the most exciting parts because the drum is basically ready for assembly once I take the tape off. Note the way I'm taking the tape off, this is actually pretty important. Make sure you peel it back against the shell just to make sure you don't tear any finish off or damage the shell in any way. Time to put the hardware on. So all the hardware I ended up getting from Drum Factory Direct and I went with Chrome because I thought it would be a nice contrast for the dark cherry shell. When I'm attaching tube lugs, I use the drill to put the screw most of the way in and then I finish it by hand because I don't want to over tighten or accidentally rip the shell. Then when I'm tuning, I go finger tight first and then use the standard crisscross method to make sure I'm applying tension to the skin evenly. I went for a medium tuning on this one and I usually tighten the bottom head about five notes higher than the top head. Let's hear how it sounds. So please let me know what you thought about the build and the sound test in the comments. I'll put some links to the products that I used from Drum Factory Direct in the description. And personally, I thought it turned out great. I really love the variation in the tone of the cherry, uh, the lighter and the darker spots. I think it looks fantastic. The cut and polish was a game changer. I'd highly recommend that for people on their drum builds. And I thought it sounded good too. I'm really looking forward to using it on recordings in the future and some gigs. So thanks for watching.